be playing the Jeopardy music. Turn out. It takes a while for it to start. I don't know why it takes so long, but it does. <coughs> I don't do that every now and then. I think it's caused all the internet traffic myself. Good morning. This is Pastor Justin Deaton with Eastside Free Will Baptist Church as we're getting ready to start our live stream. Uh, we do appreciate everybody that's joining us this morning. Of course, we've got several things planned for you today. Uh, we've got Sister Kathy that's going to be singing here in just a few moments. And then uh, Brother Kenny will be following after her. And then also, too, we've got Sister Kayla Marley. She'll be doing our children's church this morning, plus singing as well. So we've got a lot of things there for you today and we'll be after uh, for that. And then uh, at 11.15, we'll be joining you after that. So uh, so do remember uh, those things there. I'm sorry, Kayla's doing children's church, not singing. But anyways, we'll be joining, we'll be joining you after Kayla gets done. Uh, but we do appreciate everybody being with us this morning on Facebook. Uh, we do have some things we've changed around a little bit, so hopefully you'll be able to hear everybody good, loud, and clear this morning. So looking forward to that, okay? do want to mention a couple things. And then we'll get Kathy started real quickly. Do remember Kathy Loveless's family in your prayers. Her uncle uh, passed away uh, this past week, Richard Loveless. So do remember that family in your prayers. And then also, too, I've got a lot of inquiries about Sister Ruth James. She is undergoing uh, some tests this morning. And as soon as we hear some uh, results back from that, we'll pass it along. I did have a chance to talk to her yesterday. Uh, she sounded much better yesterday than she did Friday. And she didn't want me to tell the church she does appreciate your prayers. So do continue to remember Sister Ruth James in your prayers, okay? At this time, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Then we'll turn things over to Kenny and Kathy. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all you do for us. And the blessings you've given us. And Father, so thankful uh, to be able to come today on, on Facebook and be able to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thankful for everybody that's joined us today uh, that's here with us. Appreciate Kathy and Kenny and Sister Kayla here today and that's going to be on here in just a few moments father i pray you help them as always recall to remember some things they've studied and what they have prepared and father most importantly of all we just want to give you honor praise and glory for all that you do and who you are uh, father we continue to pray for sister ruth james uh, lord you know the need there physically and father i pray you give continue to give her the touch from heaven that she stands in need of and father we pray for kathy's family uh, her uncle richard loves father i pray you comfort that family especially at a time like this uh, under the circumstances where uh, things are a little different as far as services go, Father, I pray uh, that you comfort that family. And Lord, as always, we just want to give you praise and glory for all that you do. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Her last meal almost gone, but God sent Elijah to make his word known. He said, woman, don't you worry, for God sent me today. And before you even ask him, help was on the way. Just hold on a little longer, help is on the way. A brighter day is coming for those who believe and pray. Help won't help tomorrow if you give up today. Just hold on a little longer. Help is on the way. Turn all your troubles over to Jesus today. Yeah. Troubles of this life can buy. 
and bow dance get you down. You think no one is listening, you think no one's around. Just remember what his word says, trust him and obey. Keep your eyes toward the heavens, cause help is on the way. Just hold on a little longer, help is on the way. A brighter day is coming for those who believe and pray. Help won't help tomorrow if you give up today. Just hold on a little longer, cause help is on the way. Help won't help tomorrow if you give up today. Just hold on a little longer, cause help is on the way. Put your trust in Jesus. Who would have thought that two months ago that today we would be here in a Sunday school lesson on Facebook? Well, life can change fast, can't it? Man. And things can happen fast. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you, God, for the opportunity to stand for you this morning. God, we want to confess to you that we're unable. And Lord, we're sure unworthy. And God, we can't do anything apart from your holy direction. God, we don't deserve it, but we pray this morning that you would be a help to us. God, give us the very words from heaven that need to be said. Lord, you know every child of yours that needs to be encouraged. You know every word that needs to be said. God, we pray that you'd be a help to us because we can't do it on our own. God, we ask for divine anointing from heaven. Help us to say everything you'd have us to say and not say anything that you don't want said. May you get glory unto yourself in everything that's done and said. And Lord, we'll give you praise for it because we ask it in Jesus' name. He is worthy. Amen. Amen. I was uh, been working outside a lot lately, being quarantined at home. And me and Kathy set out a... Uh, a uh, wild rose bush a few years back. And man, I bet that thing grows a foot and a half a day. It just keeps you growing. You know, I've, I've routed it across the top of the fence and it just goes up. It's just unbelievable how that rose bush has grown. Uh, can't, can't find a bloom on it nowhere. But uh, I'll, you know, I'll get those limbs. They'll grow out long and I'll pick them up and try to weave them through the fence or where it's next to and keep that thing growing on top of the fence. And man, has that thing got some sharp thorns on it. You really have to be careful when you're handling that uh, wild rose bush because of the thorns. And that just got me to thinking. In Revelation chapter, or excuse me, in Genesis chapter 3, rather, uh, starting at verse 17, remember that thorns is a picture of the result of sin. Not sin itself, but the results of sin. Now, Adam and Eve is in a, a garden that was made perfect for them. Life was to be without pain and sorrow, but they chose sin. And so after they chose sin, this is what God said to them in verse 17. And, then, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she 
was the mother of all living, and unto Adam also, and unto his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, I've, I've thought about this a lot. And it wasn't God's intention for man to know about evil. Now, you think about that just a minute. I know about a lot of evil things. You won't turn on the news or you won't uh, pick up a newspaper that you won't read or see a lot of things that are very evil in today's world. But you know what? I'm not happy I know about any of them. A world without evil. Boy, God's good, ain't he? Man. He meant good for us. I mean, there's nobody you can compare him to. His intentions was for a man to live in a world without sin, without pain, without sorrow. Ain't that good? And man chose for himself to sin. And the result of this sin is thorns. Now, these thorns on this rose bush I was talking about, they kind of hook backwards, you know. And boy, if you get stretched out there, one of them limbs goes forward and comes back and hooks you, you just about to have to have somebody to come and get that thing off for you. I mean, they are some vicious thorns. I thought about the thorns I just read about, the thorns of creation. I thought about the thorns of Canaan. When Joshua first took the Hebrew children into the promised land, one of the first things they faced was thorns. Mm -hmm. I thought about the thorns of the Christian life. Yeah. Boy, I tell you, whoever tells you that uh, you live a Christian life, it's all going to be fun and games, that ain't the way it is. You see, I'm I'm human. Uh, I live in my flesh. I fight the flesh. I fight, fight the world. And bless God, I try to stay in the spirit. But you have thorns of a Christian life. And then I think about the thorns of Christ. Yeah. When we got off that bus uh, at uh, Caesarea Philippi, right on the Mediterranean Sea, when we left out of there, as soon as we got back on the road, we got out of the bus, and Ralph got out and got a, a, a branch off of a big bush there, and he held it up, held it up with his fingers like this, and it just laid against his arm, and it punched holes in his uh, arm, and blood started dripping off his elbow. Those thorns were so sharp. I think about the thorns of Christ. And so we have thorns in this life. Thank God we serve an uncommon God. You see, man chose thorns for himself. In Genesis 22, we read about a man named uh, Abraham. Abraham has a son named Isaac. And God tells Abraham to take Isaac up on Mount Moriah. And there, he's going to sacrifice him. Can you imagine how Abraham felt when uh, God tells him this? But God, uh, Abraham's obedient, and he takes Isaac up to Mount Moriah, has him tied up and ready to sacrifice him. And you know the story. The angel says, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him. And you know, that's just an uncommon thing. Uh, for God to tell a man to do. But by doing that, Abraham proves to God uh, how faithful he is. And you know how uh, the angel tells uh, Abraham, don't strike the child, don't do any harm to him. Well, later on, thousands of people, they follow Jesus all day. They've seen Jesus do all of these many miracles and they end up on a pasture where Jesus is going to preach to them. And there's, the Bible says 5,000 of them, not counting the women and children. Well, uh, by the end of the day, they're getting hungry. And the disciples go to Jesus and tell him, let them go, that they might go into town and find something to eat. And Jesus says, don't send them away. He said, what have we got? And a little boy, a lad, that has a lunch enough for him, two fishes and five little barley loaves, which is about the size of a biscuit. And God says, what do we have? And the Bible says, one of the disciples said, all we have is this lad here, and he has a little lunch. You know the story, how God takes that little boy's lunch. And listen, he didn't even count. The Bible says there was 5,000 besides the women and the children. And a little boy who didn't count, God takes his lunch, and he, in an uncommon way, he feeds all of the people there. I'm telling you that we serve an uncommon God. And so Israel leaves out of Egypt and, and all the people cried, well, we're going to starve to death. 
And God sends angels uh, food down on them uh, like wafers. And then they complain about that. And God rains quail down on them. Then they say they're going to thirst to death. And God brings water out of a rock. And in an uncommon way, God feeds all of Israel. And he sends water to them. And then Joshua marches in. And the first thing he's got to do is take Jericho. And on the seventh day, you know the story. They march seven times. And the walls around Jericho fall so they can take the city. What an uncommon way to win a battle. And we read about David, a young boy who takes a sling. And uh, just a young boy now, and he faces the greatest warrior of that day. And he takes five smooth stones and just a sling, and he slays that big giant. What an uncommon way for God to help David win a battle against the greatest warrior of that day. And in Mark chapter 2, we're going to read a story uh, about some men who have a friend that they love. Well, they had to love him because they're taking him to get help. In Mark chapter 2, at verse 1, listen to the word of God. And again, he entered, talking about Jesus, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Now, what, the, what does this mean, it was noised that he was in the house? Well, what it was, it was a call to worship. Let me show you what that noise means. That's my wife Kathy sounding the shofar. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4 that Jesus is going to descend from heaven uh, with the shout, with the sound of the trumpet. Bless God, that's what we're going to hear. That's the Jewish trumpet right there. But the call to worship had been sounded. Now the Jews sounded this trumpet for three different reasons. They sounded it uh, during if it's time to go to worship. And the trump was sounded if it was time to go to war. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, the trump was sounded at the end of the work day when it was time to go home. Bless God, the trumpet's going to sound. Jesus is going to descend and we're going to go home. Uh, but the trumpet was sounded and that was what the Bible means by the word noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together in so much as there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Now get the picture. The noise was sounded. It was called to worship. And this house is so full of people that you can't even get in the door. There's no room for nobody. Nowhere it's as full as it can possibly get. Verse 3. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born by four. Four men are carrying a stretcher, and on this stretcher lays a man sick of the palsy, and they get to the door, and they see that the house is completely filled, and there's no way they can get in. Now, they didn't do like me and you would have done. They didn't set the stretcher down with the man on it and say, Brother, it looks like today's just not your day. Uh, we got you here, and we've done all we can do, and we're just going to have to give up because we can't get you in the house. It's so crowded in there that there's no way we can get you through. So we hate that you're having a bad day, but we're just going to have to set you down and leave you here because today just ain't your day. Is that what they done? No, let's read on and see what happens. Verse 4, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof, uh, where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Yeah. Now, I've been to Israel, and a lot of the roofs, or most of the roofs in Israel, are made out of clay. And so they climb up on top of this house. One, I think in the book of Matthew, it even says that they ripped up the tiling, which was clay. And so the clay represents us. Clay represents the hands of the men that were up. Our clay represents the man sick with palsy. You see, we are the clay. And Jesus is the master potter. And he's forming the clay into what he wants us to be. So the clay tile roofing, that represents us. That represents their hands. And then the stretcher in which they were carrying him on, that represents the burden. 
And so they bring this man to Jesus. Boy, that was a good lesson for us. We need, if we're Christians, we need to bring people to Jesus. But they put him down through the roof. They tear the tiles off the roof. They lower this burden down to where Jesus is. What an uncommon way to get a man to where Jesus is. And whenever they lower him down in verse 5, 5 being the number for grace, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, they brought this man to Jesus. You know, sometimes it is that a, that a person can't get to Jesus. Thank God he goes to where they are. Man. In John chapter 5, we read about a man that had been laying for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda. And Jesus walks by him and looks down at him and asks him his question, Wilt thou be made whole? And you know what? He says, rise up, take thy bed and walk. You've been made whole. And I'm glad that when we can't get people to Jesus, Jesus comes to where we are. Man. What an uncommon way to see a man saved. What an uncommon love that he has for us. I went, uh, it, when I was in Israel, we were in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I just got a picture while I was in that garden of it being dark and Roman soldiers coming in that garden with their torches held up high and uh, to see where they was going. And Judas was leading them and Judas had done told them, the man whom I place a kiss, on, a kiss on his cheek, that will be Jesus. That'll be who he is. And he places a kiss on the cheek of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these Roman soldiers, they grab Jesus and they arrest him and they take him, and they get ready to take him to Caiaphas, the high priest's house. I believe Peter is standing behind Jesus and he wants Jesus to take up for himself. He wants Jesus to tell that Roman soldier, well, you know me, well, I healed your mother-in-law. Well, you know me, well, your next door neighbor was blind and I restored his sight. But Jesus didn't say anything. And Peter pulls out uh, the sword of a soldier named Malchus and cuts his ear off. And can you see the crowd? As Jesus reached down and picks up the ear of Malchus and puts it back on the side of his head and touches him and the blood stops. He's completely healed just in an instant. Can you imagine how everybody's mouth flew open? And Jesus turns around and says, Now, Peter, that's not the way we're going to do it. I'm not here. I didn't come for that, Peter. That's not what this is all about. And they take Jesus to Caiaphas, the high priest's house, and the tour guide took us to this basement. And I am telling you the way that they understood on how to inflict pain back in that day was just unreal. We were in Caiaphas, the high priest's basement, and on either side of where I was standing was a, a column about two foot square, chiseled out of solid rock. And these two columns went up and on across the top of them, they were joined by a column that went across the top and it was also chiseled out of solid stone. Now in this column on the top, there was a hole chiseled in the side of it. And then there was a hole chiseled in the bottom that went up and met that hole that was chiseled in the side so that they could put a leather strap through that hole and drop it out the bottom. They could wrap it around the wrist of a man. They could pull it tight. And then in the corners of these two columns was a hole chiseled through them. They pull them straps tight to a man's shoulders popped. Then they could tie him off to those uh, corner columns. Does that make sense? And then in the floor is two holes that's been dug down about the size of a five-gallon bucket. And in that five uh, in that vessel, rather, about the size of a five-gallon bucket, they kept real high-powered vinegar and lots and lots of salt. They called it bile. And when they would artfully take that cat of nine tails and lay it across the man's side and jerk quarter-sized chunks of flesh out of him, they would then take a ladle, and they would go down in that vessel, and they would pour that vinegar with that salt in it over that man's back. Now, they said the tour guide told me that that would inflict pain that morphine wouldn't stop. Just unreal at the pain that they could inflict. Now, they weren't allowed to kill anybody, mind you, but they were allowed to inflict pain. Well, I have a good imagination. Whenever I see a picture of Jesus on the wall and he's got a clean face, just a little bit of blood running down his temple, I think to myself, that's not right. That's not the way it was. You see, he was beat unrecognizable. Can you see him with both of his eyes beat completely black and bright pink on the bottom? Chunks of his beard pulled out. Chunks of his hair beat out and not a clear 
place on his face. His whole face has been bruised. That's what he looks like. And I'm standing there thinking about this. I turned around and looked, and right beside of where I was at was three jagged stripes red on the wall. And the tour guide pointed those stripes out and said, now we're not saying this is what it is. We can tell you this. We've tried to bleach those stripes out. We've tried to pressure wash those stripes out, and they're still there. And we were just wondering, could that be where the Lamb of God, with his back all torn open, put his back up against that uh, cool stone wall, maybe to ease a little bit of pain, uh, maybe to ease just a little bit all the pain, rather, that was in his back. Could it be that's what that is? And I'm standing there right close to where that is, and there's 63 people in our tour group, and I knew that when they put Jesus in that thing, that there was over 200, and many of them were dead. See, there were stairs going down into it to let us in. And I remember standing there with 63 people thinking, there's too many of us in here. I can't breathe. You know, there's, this place is crowded. And so I turned and I looked at the stripes, uh, the red stripes on the wall when the uh, tour guide mentioned it. And then he said, now we're going to put a lid on top of this thing. And we want you to experience the outer darkness that Jesus experienced when he was in this pit where they held him until they could get an appointment with Pilate to take him for, in front of Pilate. And so they cut the lights out, and I just got to thinking, you know. And this is Jesus in this pit. This is God in human flesh. He could have snapped his fingers and made a new world if he wanted to. <laughs> he could have said, I will come and do this later. Mm -hmm. When there's a more humane way of putting a man to death, when they have the electric chair or the lethal injection, I will do this later. You see, Jesus knew what was ahead. He knew what the cross was. He knew how he was going to suffer. He knew what was ahead. And yet the thought of coming out of that pit, the thought of not going to the cross, never entered his mind. <laughs> and I'm in that pit and I'm thinking about this. And I said, Lord, I'm not worthy of this. There's nothing about good and the fact that you would stay in this pit knowing what you was facing when all you had to do was look up and 10,000 angels was waiting to rescue you. And God, I'm not worthy. And why in the world would you stay in this pit knowing me like I am? And I'm telling you, the voice of God spoke to my heart down in that pit and it changed my life. You know what he said to me? He said, because that's how much I love you. Man. What an uncommon love God has for man. You know what? He's an uncommon God. Right. He's uncommon in his presence. He's everywhere all at once. I just told you he's uncommon in his love. <laughs> he's uncommon in his knowledge. And he's uncommon in his prayer. His power, rather. Ain't it good to know that we have an uncommon God? I have a friend named Daryl Harden. Daryl's been going to do radiation treatments and they told him that he was terminal, you know, and, and there just was no hope. And everybody started praying for Daryl. <laughs> he went to the doctor a couple of days ago. You know what they told him? That his cancer was completely Man. gone. Yeah. I'm telling Man. you, I serve a God that heals in an uncommon way. Right. There just ain't nobody like him and there ain't nobody to compare him to. His attributes say that he's unlimited. He's unlimited in power. He's unlimited in knowledge. He's unlimited in presence. And listen, he's unlimited in time. He has an uncommon love for us. Ain't that good? Well, I'm glad I serve a God like that because in this world, it's full of thorns, you see. It's full of problems. And we've never seen a time like we're seeing today. But you see, God never changes. Right. Problems may get worse. The world may get different. But God never changes. Now listen, he's uncommon in his reward. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 2 at verse 9 says this, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared. First right. Peter 1 4 says that we have to an inheritance uncorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away 
and it's reserved in heaven for you. Now, here's what I come to ask you this morning. I said all of that so I could say this. What will you do with Jesus? He's uncommon, but you have a choice to make, you see. There's only two, by the way, accept or reject. Yes. I wish I didn't have to have this last point. I wish I could sit down right now and never say another word, but i got to tell you about the last thing that God is uncommon in. He's uncommon in His judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Revelation 19.10 talks about the devil that's been deceiving the whole world, his final resting place. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night. Now listen, I just told you, he's uncommon in his judgment. But let me show you how good he is. He lets you choose. <laughs> Ain't that good? I hear people all the time say, how can God send us to anybody to hell? How can anybody choose hell over heaven? God lets you choose. You see, he don't force you. Now, I've heard people say this, and I'm sure you have too, in the book of Romans, chapter 3, at verse 23, I've heard people say, well, you know, I live a pretty good life. I'm, I'm a good person. I've never been in jail. I've never had nothing more than a speeding ticket in my life. I'm a pretty good person. God will let me in just because I'm good. But Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. Well, that, that shoots that thought in the head, don't it? Then some people say, well, I've been so bad. God couldn't save me. I, I'm just the worst person in the world. But Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He, 2,000 years ago, he wasn't limited to time. He saw you here today and where you are, and he knew your greatest need would be a Savior. You see, and knowing you and knowing how you are and who you was, even though he could choose, he chose to die for you. There ain't nobody ever loved you like that. Romans says, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't believe I'll ever get over that verse as long as I live. And then Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But thank God the gift of God is eternal life. That's for people that says, well, I'll just choose when I get ready to die. I don't have to choose now. I'll wait till I'm on my deathbed, and then I'll choose. You see, you don't know when that's going to be. That could happen so fast that uh, you, you wouldn't have a chance to do that. But God lets you choose. There's a payment for. There is a result of. There is an end to sin. And that's death. That's what I read to you in Revelation chapter 19. And this morning... What will you do with Jesus? Will you accept him or will you reject him? It's totally up to you. I wish I could make the decision for you, but I can't. I love my wife more than anything, but she can't choose for me. And I can't choose for her. I have to choose for me. And so today I put before you the question of life and death. Choose life. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for letting us be here. Thank you for your word. God, thank you that even though we're shut down in quarantine, we can get together and study your word. Amen. We pray, God, now that you continue. Bless our preacher, God, as he stands before us to break the bread of life. We sure do need to hear from heaven. God bless Kayla as she comes after me to teach children's church. Pray, God, you'd use them both in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you want to, fine. If not, it's fine. It matter. You're good either way. You're good. Are you? Appreciate that, Brother Kenny. Outstanding job, uh, you and uh, Sister Kathy. And I hope you've enjoyed that so far. As I said a few moments ago, it is really good to have Sister Kayla Marley with us this morning. Uh, she's going to come up and do a children's church lesson. Uh, of course, last week, Brother Fred was with us. And now this week, Sister Kayla uh, is with us. And she's an also one of our children's church teachers. Does an outstanding job. Also teaches Sunday school here. Uh, at the church. So we appreciate her work and appreciate what she does. And also to Patch the Pirate on Wednesday night. So we may have some of our Patch kids watching uh, this morning. 
So uh, she does quite a bit around here, as you can tell. So uh, you be praying for her as she comes at this time. Hi, guys. Um, it's been a while, obviously. Um, I am so short on this little screen. Okay, so um, I'm kind of doing an object lesson, but where um, everything is so hard to find, I could not find anything that I needed. So you're just going to have to imagine with me. Um, so it's COVID-19, right? Coronavirus, um, Corona, the virus, everything that's going on, all that kind of stuff. We've heard about it, right? Um, you've seen everybody masks on their faces, gloves on their hands. Um, I did wash my hands before I came here. I promise you that people are putting hand sanitizer on their hands every minute. Okay. You know, everything's going on. You haven't been able to go to school. You haven't been able to go to the park. Um, there has to be so many people in the grocery store, all these things, you know, what's going on. You've seen it and it's hard, right? It's ridiculous. Honestly, I think it is. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. Okay. We we're here, right? I'm here and I'm teaching you through the internet. We never thought this would happen, but thankfully we have the means and we have the opportunity to do this. Right? right. So I'm going to try it and it's going to be weird looking at myself and not looking at you guys. So just bear with me. Okay. So, um, also, I'm reading off my phone because the printer would not print my lesson. There you go. So I'll bet you um, I'll bet you have seen and heard a lot on the news lately about the virus that is around the world. It can be a little bit scary, can it? I know it's it's very scary, honestly. Um, there are many people who have gotten sick and even died, but there are many who have survived and who have come out of it really good. And that's that's what we need to focus on. Amen. So. And you know, the virus is something you can't see with your eyes. We can't see it. It's just like the wind blowing on a windy day. We cannot see it, but it's there, right? We see the effects of it. So it is, um, some people don't believe that it's a big deal, but it's important to be careful. That's why I could not find any Lysol or Clorox wipes or gloves or a mask. I couldn't find any of it. So um, it is, the virus is so tiny. It's just so little. We can't see it with our eyes. Okay. And it's, a, it's possible to spread it even without realizing it. We can't see the virus, but we know what it does because we see the effects it has on people. I mean, how many people are in the hospital right now because of it, right? So we see the effects of it. We just don't see it with our own eyes. So, so when we do things like keep things clean, wash our hands or use sanitizer, we are trying to stay safe. We can't see all of the protective things in our cleaning supplies, but we trust they will kill germs and help us, right? We have to trust that it does. We're just trying to do what we can. So, you know our lives are a little bit like that. We do sinful things that can harm us and we need protection for our hearts, okay? Um, do you know where we get that from? We get it from God. And the great news is that unlike hand sanitizer, we don't have to worry about how effective God's work is because we know that in Jesus, we are already made clean. Wow. That's probably the best part of the lesson. I could stop right now and just be done, but I'm going to keep going. So in the gospel lesson, one of Christ's disciples named Thomas said that he wouldn't believe Jesus had really come back from the dead unless he could see him and touch him physically. Okay, so let me set the scene for you. Last Sunday was Easter, right? And so whenever we talk about Easter, we're talking about Jesus dying on the cross and then coming back in three days. But we don't always talk about the fact that his disciples, the men who had followed him for decades, okay, helping him witness to others, had to sit and just like wait in a house and be quarantined like us while they waited, you know, to see if they were going to be ridiculed too for following Jesus. 
They just saw the man that they had dedicated their lives to on a cross, put into a tomb. And they thought, this is it. What do we do next? Mm -hmm. They were done. In their minds, they were done. So you have all the disciples, except for Thomas, wherever he was, okay? They're all in a house and they're just like, we can't leave. The soldiers are out everywhere. They're going to come for us too. So what do we do now? So they sat and they waited and they waited. And then finally, they saw him. They saw Jesus, the one who had died on the cross, the one who had been put into the tomb. They saw him and they were Oh, so excited, obviously. So they run to Thomas and they're like, Thomas, dude, we saw him. Yeah. He's here. And Thomas is like, no, he's not. No, I don't believe it. And they're like, no, dude, we saw it with our eyes. We're telling you we would not lie to you. And he's like, I don't care. I don't believe you. Not until I see him with my own eyes and I touch the scars in his hands which put on gloves, Thomas, that's gross. But Thomas wasn't going to believe until he touched the scars in his hands. Yeah. Okay. Ugh. So now I've, I got on my Thomas story. Okay. Well, Jesus showed up and there was no more doubting or denying his resurrection. He told Thomas that he was believing after seeing but Jesus said that people who believe without seeing are especially blessed. Okay. Who might who might that be? Believing without seeing? Well, that's us, right? We haven't seen Jesus on earth and we can't see God with our eyes, but we believe that Jesus did come to live, die and rise again. Yeah. And that gives us joy and hope even when things are uncertain and we don't know what the future holds. We know who holds the future. We know that God is in control. We can't see the virus and that's scary. We can't always see what causes sin and that's really scary. Yeah. But God is much greater than sickness, sin, and even death. He loves us enough to send Jesus to die to defeat all of that. We know that our trust in him will protect us no matter what. God's love conquers and casts out fear. We can still be careful and keep ourselves clean and safe, which we should do. We trust that God is in control. We haven't seen Jesus, but we know the effect his work has on us. And we know it gives us life. Yeah. Clorox wipes may dry out, but God's love and power will never fail. And we have Amen. to believe that. Amen. Unlike Thomas, we have to believe it without seeing. Mm -hmm. And that's my lesson. So... I'll say a little prayer for us, okay? So, dear God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Thank you for the message that we've already heard from Kenny and the message we will hear from the preacher this morning. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to communicate in an unconventional way, but communicate no matter what. We just pray that this helps and that soon we will be able to meet again in a normal way, the way we are used to, the way that we love. In your name, amen. amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sister Kayla. Appreciate that. That brought back a pleasant memory. I remember the first message I preached. Uh, after I announced my calling was where do we go from here? And it was about the disciples after Christ had, had died and the women had told him he had resurrected, but they had not seen him themselves and wondered what they were going to do next. So appreciate that from Sister Kayla. And I hope you've enjoyed so far, Brother Kenny, uh, Sister Kathy, and Sister Kayla. Appreciate them taking the time to be here with us this morning and appreciate the outstanding job they've done. I do want to mention a, a, couple, of th a couple of announcements. First off, uh, as you know, the governor has uh, extended the, the uh, stay-at-home uh, order until April the 30th. So I do know that we will be doing our Facebook 
this Wednesday. We'll start at 6 o'clock once again. Brother Kenny will be on at 6, and then I'll be on at uh, 6.30. And then next Sunday, uh, we'll follow the same schedule, 10.15, uh, 10.45, and 11.15 here on Facebook. And then the following Wednesday at uh, 6 and 6.30. Now, anything can happen. Uh, anything can change. Uh, I mean, something could take place in the next hour today that could change that whole thing around and, and we could end up having church. But for right now, that's the plan. Also, too, tonight at 530 and next Sunday night at 530. I'll be on for Sunday night service, okay? So I do be praying about that. Uh, of course, you have seen what the president has put out uh, about uh, uh, phasing in, uh, opening things back up. Of course, religious organizations, which is us, are also mentioned in that. Uh, I do know the association, We several pastors and myself included, have sent messages out to the association because it was pretty vague what was put out. Uh, just kind of asking for guidance and some suggestions from them. So we'll probably be getting some news back on that this week. And then thinking about maybe getting back in the church, hopefully in a couple of weeks. And of course, all that depends uh, on what happens. So that's just kind of a long uh, couple of week plan out there. So we'll see what takes place, see what happens and take it from there okay so i do remember all those announcements there also too don't forget your tithes uh, and offerings if you want to mail those in uh, please do so 704 siam road Elizabeth, in tennessee uh, you can mail those in or if you want to come by sanders here at the church uh, usually in the morning times and drop them off either way uh, that will be fine so i do remember that well uh, of course brother kenny a few moments ago did mention brother daryl harden yeah, I tell you, that was great news. He called me up Friday, uh, said he was cancer-free, so we thank the Lord for that. That, that was just wonderful news. I tell you what, uh, you know, I, I was really concerned about Sister Ruth and what was going on there and uh, what was happening. And, uh, you know, you kind of, you know, you, you get a little down when you hear news like that. Sister Ruth is one of our prayer warriors here at the church and uh, loved her to death and very encouraging. Uh, a lady to me and to a lot of folks in our church family. So it was a little bit, you know, a little bit of a downer that she had to go to the hospital and what was going on in her life. And then Brother Darrell called me up, told me what happened to him. So that kind of uplifted our spirits. Of course, now Sister Ruth is having, uh, of course, a test this morning. So do remember her uh, in your prayers. I uh, do want to mention a couple other things, as we mentioned a few months ago, uh, about Sister Kathy's family. Her uncle passed away. I do continue to remember uh, that family in your prayers as well, okay? So uh, do remember those uh, prayer requests and continue to remember each other in prayer. And I, I tell you what, I do want to give out a, a hello to the folks at uh, Brookdale and Bristol. Uh, my wife is working this weekend, and uh, she said she'd get me on there live so they could see me this morning. So all the residents at Brookdale and Bristol want to wave and say hi to you and uh, say hi to my wife too. I love you. Thanks for uh, getting those folks on this morning. And, uh, you know, being able to watch us today. And I hope they've enjoyed the thing so far. So do good to have them with us as well. And all folks that are, that are watching this morning, good to have you as well. I uh, do want to mention one other uh, prayer request. Uh, do continue to remember, uh, let me find it here again in just a second, uh, Dawn. Uh, this is a member of Mary Gotze's uh, family. There was a concern that she may have uh, the virus. Uh, they have done some tests on her, and they are awaiting test results uh, to come back. We did have a case uh, affiliated with the church uh, in our extended family. Uh, Jack Hoss, his uh, son-in-law, uh, working down in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he did contract the virus down there. He lives in Stone Creek. So do remember uh, his family in your prayers. Uh, of course, he has a wife and kids as well. So do please remember them uh, that God will continue to protect them, okay? So God bless you once again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Before we do, uh, we want to have you open up your Bibles, if you would, to the uh, book of Luke. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 27. Uh, this, of course, is a very popular uh, passage of Scripture. I preached from this uh, several times before on the radio, also here at church on Sunday morning. Uh, this concerns the rich young ruler. Now, while you're turning over there, I do want to do this. The verses before this are interesting and kind of lay out the foundation for how the Lord wants us to preach uh, this morning concerning the rich young ruler. In verse 15, I'm going to read those verses while you're turning over to, to verse 18. But in verse 15, the three verses before the rich young ruler approaches Christ, this is what the Bible says. And they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. Now, infants is 
helpless babies, okay? But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Okay? Those are the verses before the rich young rulers. They were bringing the Savior infants, babies. I'd say children probably around the age of five, four years old and younger. They were bringing to him. Okay, now, verse 18, enter the rich young ruler. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. He said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Bible says in verse 23, When he had heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. When Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter in the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? He said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. I'm going to preach this more with the Lord's help. It is not what you have but it is what you need. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all you do for us. And once again, we thank you so much, Brother Kenny, Sister Kathy, and Sister Kayla, for joining us this morning. Thank you for Brother Fred and Sister Lois. They're here as well. Allow us to use some of their machines to be able to put our uh, Facebook broadcast on. Father, we thank you for all those that have contributed. Thank you for the sermons and the lessons that we've heard and the singing that we've got to enjoy. And Father, I pray it's been a blessing to those that have heard of this morning. But most importantly of all, Father, as always, we want to give you honor, praise, and glory for what you do. And we can't thank you enough for what you've done for Brother Darrell and, and touching his body and touching his life. What, what a great walking testimony that, that is now. He joins the ranks of many others here at our church that are walking testimonies to the power of the living God. And Father, I pray now that you use us as a vessel this morning. Speak to us as only you can. This is what you've laid upon our heart today concerning the rich young ruler. Father, if anybody's listening today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, Father, I pray, as Brother Kenny said a few moments ago, they will choose life and choose Christ. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It is not what you have, but what you need. Okay? We take much comfort. All right? And it is what we got many times. It blinds us to what we need. Now, let's step back for a minute. I, I know we're having to shelter in place and shelter at home and, and stay at home. You know, as Kayla brought out a few moments ago, you know, it's, we cannot see, uh, but we know that it may be out there. Therefore, we have to take precautions for it. We don't like that, but let's face it. At least we're sheltering in homes that have air conditioning. We're sheltering in homes. If it gets cold, we got heat. Uh, as last time I checked, I've been to Food City. I have been to I've been to a few convenience stores and things like that. And other than toilet paper, we have plenty to eat. Okay? Uh, I still can't figure that out. I, I don't know. I, I'm trying. I've asked the Lord to help me build a sermon. Why toilet paper? I don't know. Anyways, uh, here you go. But what I'm trying to tell you is, and I looked this morning, and I've got my clothes on. I am wearing my pants. Okay? Uh, I'm not standing here in my shorts and my Bermudas, but I am wearing my pants. I've got my clothes on. I can assure you that everybody in here that's been up before me is fully clothed, okay? So we got clothes. We all came in cars this morning, all right? And, and what I'm trying to tell you is we have a lot of comforts that we're enjoying. Even in a time of a virus, even in a time we're having to shelter in place and shelter at home, we still get to enjoy a lot of comforts of life, all right? So God has taken care of us. We are blessed. I'll be honest with you today. And I've said this before when it comes to the rich young ruler. If you want to know who the rich man is according to the Bible standards, all you got to do is look around you because every American is rich. Okay? If you compare us to the rest of the world, we are very rich. The poorest person 
in our area is richer probably than 60% or 70% of the residents of the world. So that's something to think about there. So we are blessed in the comforts that we get to enjoy. But a lot of times that blinds us to what we really need. And that's what the rich young ruler, and I know I've preached many times about, you know, you know, the one thing that he lacked in Christ. I said, he just didn't have room in his heart for Jesus. And that's why Jesus wanted him to sell all of his riches to make room in his heart. And he was unwilling to do that. And that gives us the crux of this sermon. You know, this rich young ruler has a lot of things and it has blinded him to what he really needs. If we go back and we look at children, that's why I read those verses before that. It's, it's not by accident that you have infants and babies being brought to Christ because here's the thing. Without the provision of their parents or those legal guardians that are taking care of them, children cannot fend for themselves. They cannot take care of themselves. What they have is totally dependent upon their parents. Okay? Everything that they are, everything that they have, their food, their clothing, their shelter, everything they have is totally dependent upon mom and dad. And we see here this rich young ruler, he has a lot of things in comparison to children that really don't have anything other than what their parents provide for them. So enter the rich young ruler. Here he comes on the scene. He begins to talk to Christ. I think he's genuinely interested in wanting to know what it is he can do to have eternal life. Let's look at him this morning. First off, we see that he does have a lot of things materially. If the Bible says you're very rich, then you must be very rich. Okay? If the Word of God says that, you be. And we see this rich young ruler has a lot of things materially. The Bible says he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. So this man wants for nothing. Jesus points out, too, that his riches must be quite vast. Even the Lord himself says in verse 24, How hardly shall they that have riches enter in the kingdom of God. So Christ also realizes the fact, hey, you are a very rich individual. As far as materialistically goes, you don't want for anything. You've got money, you've got clothes, you've got a home, you've got provision, you've got people with you. You are very rich indeed as far as material goes. We look at verse 18, that brings us to the next point here. Verse 18, the Bible says, and a certain ruler. Now, not only is this guy rich materially, but he's also rich in authority. If the Bible calls you a ruler, then he is a ruler over some folks. He has folks that report to him. He has people that he tells them, I need you to do this or I need you to do that. It is quite possible and probably very well evident that this man is probably interested or involved in the politics in and around the city where he is at. In other words, he probably has some influence. With government, he probably has some influence with local authorities. He may have influence with a Sanhedrin court, the local religious authorities. So this man probably has his hands in a lot of things. I think the Bible says he's very rich. The Bible says he's a certain ruler. He has a lot of authority. He's able to, I should say, promote his influence, whereas other people would not be able to. So this man has a lot, if you will, materialistically. He is very rich. He has much. I also want to note too, in verse 22, he has access to the poor. Jesus said, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all thy hast and distribute unto the poor. Now, Christ would not ask him to do that unless the rich and ruler had the means and the access to do that. Always remember, Christ always tells you what's on people's heart. Amen. When you read the four gospels, anybody that approaches the Savior. When the Savior is talking to them, he is revealing to you, the reader, what is on their heart. So he sees in this rich young ruler's heart that he has a lot of riches. He is really rich. He's got a lot of authority, rulership. He can make things happen. He has influence. Also, too, he has accessibility to the poor. That tells me, as a student of the Bible and as a preacher of the Word, that this rich young ruler has probably helped the poor on occasion. I believe that. I don't believe Christ would have said that to him if he did not see that the rich young ruler had probably done that at some time or some form or another. So even Christ realizes you've got access to the poor. You can help them out. And he must be willing to help. He may have done it in the past. Very possible. And I, I believe that he probably did. 
with his influence and his riches, he probably has. So we see another thing about him. Lastly here, as far as being rich materially, in his, uh, in, in, his, in his position of power and influence, he has realized that he is not immune to death. Verse 18, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, let, let me once again frame this for you on the rich young ruler. He's rich materialistically, but he's also rich in things he's experienced. Now, let's be honest. If you've got money, you can do some traveling. All right, you can experience some things, okay? And I'm not being me. I mean, if I'll be honest with you. If I was to be blessed with riches, I would probably do a lot of traveling myself. You know, I hope to at one time uh, later on in life, uh, if, if I'm able to, I'd like to go see some places I've never seen before. You know, here in the United States, if the, if the potential is there to go uh, somewhere other places in the world, I'd like to do that. I was blessed to be able to go uh, on a cruise over around Italy, see Rome, see those places there. I'm very thankful that I was able to do that. Also, too, blessed in the fact I was able to go to the Holy Land and see where Jesus walked and see Jerusalem, the empty tomb, the place called Golgotha, the place of Calvary, the city of Jerusalem, the Sea of Galilee. I was very blessed to do those things, okay? There is nothing wrong with that at all. And this rich young ruler, what I'm trying to get you to understand, people of Jesus' day, rich or poor, are not much different than people of our day. Let's face it. Do the rich not influence our elections? I mean, Michael Bloomberg. Why did he get in the political election to begin with? He had the money to do so. Donald Trump had the money to do so. I mean, the man's not even being paid by the government to be the president of the United States because he has a lot of money, okay? And I'm not saying that's right, wrong, or in there. I'm just simply pointing out that people that have money can influence things, and we realize that. Also, too, in Jesus' day, they influence things as well. Also, folks that have money can do some traveling. And I think this rich young ruler has run around and experienced life. He, has, he may have actually been to the city of Rome. He may have actually been down, I guess it would be Alexandria, down in Egypt as it was called in his day. He may have been some other places and done some traveling. He's seen a lot of things, but he realizes something. I'm not going to live forever. I'm not going to be young forever. So he begins to realize that. And he hears about Jesus Christ. He hears about the preaching that Jesus is doing and his influence. And I'll be honest with you, that's where I think the poor come into play. I think in his helping the poor, if you will. When he done that, I think the poor people that Jesus really preached to a lot, who really listened to him, has probably said something to him. They said, you know what? There's this guy, Jesus, that's preaching about eternal life, and, and we've decided to follow him. And I believe that's what the rich young ruler, how he came into contact, or came to know who Christ is. So hence, here he is, he realizes, I'm not going to live forever. How can I do that? I would like to continue experiencing the things that I am experiencing. So we see that this man has a lot in the material world. Let's take it a step further. We also see that he has a lot morally. The Bible says, all right, first off, he calls him in verse 18, good master. Jesus said there's none good save one that is God. He also says in verse 20, Jesus talking to the rich young ruler now, thou knowest the commandments. Now, now you understand what Christ means by that. Thou knowest the commandments. In other words, Christ sees the heart. He not only sees the heart, he knows what's going on between the ears. Nothing is hidden from God. Nothing is hidden from Christ. So not only is there revelation as to what is on the heart, there is revelation a lot of times what's on your mind. Okay, so Christ says, thou knowest the commandments. In other words, I know you know them. He goes on and says, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear fitness, witness, honor thy father and mother. The rich and ruler says, all these have I kept from my youth up. Now, we call him the rich young ruler, all right? But we notice that even at his young age, which he's probably under the age of 30, we see since he's been a small boy, that he's been an ardent studier of the law. He says, I've kept these from my youth up. Christ does not argue with him. 
Christ knows that he's done that because he says so. Thou knowest the commandments. So this young man has a lot of, I want to say, biblical or Old Testament knowledge. If he has studied the law, then he has also studied the prophets. Being a rich young ruler, he has accessibility to some of those prophets' books. The books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and no doubt, he has taken the time to read those things, which brings us back to his original question, what can I do to inherit eternal life? So he's kind of believing, if you will, yeah, Jesus Christ, this person very well could be the Messiah that was promised by the prophets of old. So I'm going to ask him, if anybody can give me eternal life, he can. So this man has a lot of moral value. He's kept those things. He has studied those things. He says he's kept the commandments. He's probably kept it better than the religious leaders. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were known for not only for what they've done to Christ, but also too for their corruption. Jesus pointed that out on many times. What's very ironic here, Jesus does not point out any corruption in the rich young ruler. Yeah. See, when I was studying this, and I've studied this many times before, I thought to myself, if you go back and you look at Christ's interaction with the Pharisee and Sadducee, he would point out their corruption yeah. on many occasions. And the rich young is basically like any Pharisee would do. He has said, I have kept the commandments. Christ says, I know you've kept them. I can see it in your heart. I can see it in your mind. I know you have. But he points out no corruption in the rich young ruler. None whatsoever that he has taken from somebody. What I'm trying to tell you is he has acquired his riches evidently, in a legal and truthful way. Hard work. Using his mind. Okay? Putting himself in a position to be able to take advantage of opportunity should it arise, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? That's just somebody being smart, trying to do the best they can to put themselves in a better position. I think about when I worked at Siemens. I started off there working in the warehouse. I knew they had engineering jobs in there. I thought, well, I'll get my foot in the door. And I'll start out by that by that avenue there, work in a warehouse, show myself to be punctual, to be on time, show a little bit of the skill sets that I got, and if something opens up, take my shot at it. And lo and behold, that's what I did. I worked for a year in the warehouse, so third shift, they began to post jobs there. I knew around August time, they would start posting jobs for engineering and manufacturing and, and so forth, and master planners, which is what I happened to be. Sure enough, they posted some jobs on there. I applied for them, got interviewed, and got the job. I simply took advantage of the opportunity that I had prepared myself to do. And I believe that's what the rich young ruler done. I think that's how he got his riches. I think he simply done hard work, put himself in a position to succeed, done the best that he could, because Christ does not point out any corruption. And the fact that the Bible says, do not steal or do not bear false witness. That tells me this guy didn't steal, he didn't lie. He done his things honestly and truthfully. Okay? I'm really trying to lay out here, this guy, is a, he's a really good guy. He has a lot. He's got a lot materialistic. He's got a lot morally. I believe he's a man of very strong integrity. Once again, Christ does not point out any corruption in him. The fact that Christ says, go and give your stuff to the poor also testifies to the fact that this young ruler has probably done that in times past. So he has a lot of integrity. He does have a heart to care about others. Amen. So we see there, he has a lot material, he has a lot morally. Christ says he only lacks one thing. Now, that right there is important. An important statement. He says, you only lack one thing. Now, Christ didn't say he had things he had to go do morally. He didn't say he had things he had to learn. No, he said you lack one thing. Okay? Get back to the title of the sermon. It's not what you have. It is what you need. There are a lot of people in hell this morning. They had a lot materialistically, had a lot morally, great and good people. May even have plaques on walls about their goodness and what they've done. But they lacked one thing. See, the rich young ruler trusted in the things that he had built in his life. 
Stay with me now. You really want to hear this. He trusted the things he had built in his life, his riches, his authority, his influence. Those are the things that he trusted because those are the things that he had built himself. Still with me? Go back to the children. Kids can't do that. A baby does not have the ability to go out and exert powerful influence on leaders or rulers. A baby or a small infant does not have the ability to go out and acquire great riches through hard work. I repeat once again, they are totally dependent upon their mother and father, and those are the very people that approached Jesus before this rich young ruler did. He's trusting in what he has. Christ says you lack one thing, and therefore it's the one thing he needed. What was it, preacher? He needed to trust Christ. Amen. See, I go back to what Kayla said a few months ago. I, I didn't know what Kayla was going to teach on this morning. <clears throat> But here you are. Here we are. Okay. Go back to Thomas. All right. Jesus said, greater is he that's not seen, yet he believes when he replied to Thomas. When Thomas said, I've got to see the scars. i got to see his side until I see him in front of me breathing. And I place my hands in those scars and his hands in his side. I'm not believing. And Jesus made that statement to him. Okay. Go back to the children in verses 15 through 17. They see their parents. Therefore, they know they can trust their parents. They're totally dependent upon them. Let's go to the rich young ruler, okay? The rich young ruler is in the presence of Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, like Thomas, he sees Jesus Christ face to face. That's what makes this all the more perplexing as to why he did not trust the Savior. He's right there. He has no doubt probably witnessed some of his miracles, some of the things that he's done. Why not trust him? Why not trust what he has done? Why not trust what he is saying? If you've come up to him enough to realize that I've got to have eternal life, and here's the thing, I said it last week. If you were promised eternal life or all the riches of this world, anybody with a brain is going to choose eternal life. Because in that eternal life, you can acquire whatever riches you want to acquire if you've got all eternity to do so. And that rich young ruler, that thought process, I would think, had to go through that. But here's the thing. He keeps trusting in the things that he has built in this world. And that's what a lot of people's problems are today. Amen. They are trusting the things of this world. We go back and we look at the virus. We're trying to trust, you know, the president. And I understand he's doing the best job that he can. In my personal opinion, I think he's done a pretty good job under the circumstances. I think the governor of Tennessee has done the best that he can under the circumstances trying to navigate through this. I agree there's probably that can be changed, but we all know hindsight's 2020. We can all look back and say, yeah, I probably could have done that differently than what I did that. I understand all of that, but here's the thing. Too many people out there are putting all their trust in government. They're putting all their trust on their job. They're putting all their trust on stock markets. They're putting all their trust in people around them. They're putting all their trust in the church. They're putting all their trust in the preacher. None of those things can give you eternal life. Amen. Only Jesus Christ can. Yes. And there's where the rich young ruler is making his mistake. He will not trust Christ. He had to let go of what he loved, okay? And the world in this life because it is temporary. For whatever reason, the knowledge of this man, and I think he's a very smart young man, very... He just could not see that. He just didn't have the room in his heart. He wouldn't make the room. He said, now I've got all these riches which gives me a means to do those things and I don't want to give all that up. I want to keep that and serve God too. Here's the thing, friend. The first commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy mind, body, soul, and spirit. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay? Those are the two commandments which Jesus Christ presents back to the rich young ruler. But here's the thing. You can love your neighbor as much as yourself and still die and go to hell. Okay. Remember, number one is love the Lord thy God. Mm -hmm. You've got to trust Christ in order to have eternal life. 
He would not let go of those things. And that's what he needed. Next thing we notice there too, to see that material things and moral living, though important, do not gain eternal life. It is man's goodness. You know, we hear a lot of this on TV. If your good outweighs your bad, you'll go to heaven. No, friend, that is that is not true. That is not scriptural. That is not in this book. If that's the case, the rich young ruler is in heaven. And Jesus says himself, this is what he says himself, he went away sorrowful. Matter of fact, the Bible says, verse 24, that he was very sorrowful. Not only was he very rich, which means he was incredibly rich, he was also very sorrowful which means he was incredibly sorrowful. No, friend, he didn't go to heaven because he would not trust Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. The rich young ruler would not do that. We notice here too that Christ even says so. He is the way. Verse 22, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Look at the last four words. And come, follow me. Yeah. There's a lot of folks, I'm afraid, in the world today that are coming to churches sitting on pews, listening to preachers preach, and leave them lost as they were when they came in. Amen. Amen. Friend, it's not found in a ritual. It's not found in a habit. And don't get me wrong that those things are important. It's like communion last Sunday morning is important. The church is important. Okay, all those things are important. But you better have a relationship with Christ. Amen. Do you trust the Lord this morning? You know, Kayla said in her lessons this morning, <clears throat> Jesus said so, greater is he that's never seen yet he believes. That's you and I. I. I've never seen Christ. I mean, if we would put as much belief in Jesus as we put in the virus, why, the United States of America would have the greatest revival this world has ever seen Amen. in recorded history. Do you realize that? You know, I'll be honest with you. When I was at Walmart the other day, I had my mask on. Yeah. Now, I've got my reasons for that. You know, a lot of people can look at me like, well, you're young. You know, my wife works in a nursing home or assisted living place. I'm sorry, Brooke Dale, assisted living. The average age is in their mid-80s. So I'm trying to be careful. My son delivers pizzas for Pizza Hut. He has a mask and gloves on too. He's 21 years old. You know, they have that contactless at Pizza Hut where they don't even contact the food. So even furthermore, but he still does that. Aware of what his mother and me aware of what my wife has to do every day and take care of folks at Brookdale. But yeah, I, I'm wearing it too. You know, I, I go out places. We had the food bank this past Tuesday. Had my mask on. Folks come up, drove up. They told us what they, what, what, who they were. We gave them their food. They never got out of their cars. We didn't allow it. Yeah, we're doing what we can do because, you know, I'm just going by the news and going by what I'm being told. I do think it's serious. I do think you got to be careful. If you want to talk to me sometime, I'll give you my own personal opinions about it and what I think has happened, what's going on, but I ain't going to do it on Facebook, on church service. You just have to ask me personally and I'll tell you, okay? But be that as it may, I do think it's a serious issue and a serious problem. I want us to get by with it as fast as anybody else does. But here's the thing. If we put as much faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as we do in believing that virus, we'll get that virus. I'll repeat once again, the revival that America would have would be unprecedented. The revival that the world would experience would be unprecedented. Could you imagine if, if folks were to have that kind of belief that they have in the virus, they'd have that kind of belief in the Lord Jesus Christ that they too cannot see. Now, I know evidence that he's been there. Just like that virus, I see the evidence of that virus being there. Unfortunately, of people dying. Unfortunately, of people getting severely sick. At the same time, I've seen the evidence of Jesus Christ's existence. I saw it Brother Darrell this past Friday when he called me up and told me that his cancer was gone. I see it at church on Sunday morning where folks stand up and testify to the goodness and the greatness of God. When folks come up the altar and give their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ and remain faithful to the house of God because it wasn't found in a ritual he was found in a relationship and a change of heart. Amen. And the rich young ruler would not allow that to happen. See, it's up to him. It was up to him. Now, I've heard theologians before in this story say that, you know, I don't know that Christ would have made him sell all he had. Let me, let me tell you something. 
And I'll, and I'll give you an illustration like this. And I'll close. As y'all know, we've got a little dog at the house. He's officially 12 weeks old Friday. We've had him officially six weeks. His name is Jax. He's a little beagle chihuahua mix, okay? You know, he has a false sense of how things work around our household. Boy, you need to pray for that dog. He's going to have a hard time when life goes back to normal, but he'll be all right. He'll survive. But anyways, I remember Tina telling me she went down the pound to get him, okay? They had just brought those puppies in, six weeks old, to the pound, and, you know, he spent one night in there. Tina said that he was in a cage around a bunch of cats, and said she walked in there, and they said, we just had these small dogs brought to us, small puppies. They're a chihuahua mix. So you know they're not going to get very big. And she was wanting another house dog to replace hers. Misty had passed away back in December. We'd had her about 13 years. So Tina walked in there, and, and there was Jax. You know, they handed her one dog, and this little boy really liked it. So Tina gave it up, you know, said, here, you can have this. And then she spied Jax. He was another puppy in the litter. And she said he was all up in the corner, had his head down, and wouldn't look. Shaking and everything, real scared. So Tina reached over to him and got him, and, and you know he was real scared. Didn't, didn't you know he was just scared and petrified. He didn't know what was going to happen. He was just six weeks old. So she picks him up. She said, "I picked him up," and of course she fell in love with him instantly. And you know you, you knew then that dog was coming to our house. Here he comes. All right. So she picks him up, swaddles him in that little blanket. And he cuddles up to her, scared to death and a shaking and everything. So she. Uh, fills the papers out, adopts him, and brings him home. Brings him to the house. And, of course, he's got them little feet and them little claws are dug into her shoulder. He won't let go of her. He's petrified and scared to death. Now, as an hour would pass and a couple of hours would pass, all of a sudden, he that tail would start wagging. And she'd set him in the floor, and, and he'd start moving around a little, little bit, checking me out, checking Austin out, and... Next thing you know, he'd lay on me or he'd lay on Austin and he'd start to play. I mean, in and, and, and less than about four hours later, that tail would wag so hard, he would slap both of his legs. Okay? See, that, that's the excitement that a person ought to have when Christ comes to get them out of sin's prison. Amen. Amen? I, I mean, sin's got you in prison this morning. You may think you've got a lot, and you may have a lot, but friend, it's not what you have. It's what you need, Amen. and you need Jesus. Amen. And sin's got you in prison, okay? And them cats that's in that prison with you can't give you eternal life. I use for them cats can't break that dog out. But here come my wife who represented Christ. Here, I'll take him. That's what Jesus does for you. Amen. I'll take him. I'll take her. Come on, I'll get you out of here. And you go from a little wire cage that's about five by five. Now, you know what that little dog does? He's in a big old house now at our home. He sleeps in our bed. I got mixed feelings about that. So he went from sleeping in a pound to sleeping in a bed amongst people that love him. And you could tell he's comfortable. I was sitting there, I was reading something the other day about him. And, and they say you could tell when a dog's really comfortable with his surroundings when he lays on his back. And I went to bed the other night and I was getting ready to get in the bed. And Tina was laying in the bed. He lays right in the middle. And I turned my phone on. And there he laid on his back. He looked at me with the biggest smile on his face. Boy, this is living, ain't it? And I said, yeah, it sure is. But that's what Christ wants to do for you. He even told the rich young ruler, treasure in heaven you spend eternity with me. If you'll just follow me, trust me. Amen. It's not in what you have, friend. It's in what you need. And we all need Jesus. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for all you do for us. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the wonderful illustrations of it. <clears throat> Father, as always, we want to be sure and get the entire context out. I don't think it's by accident that we hear young infants and young children and then here comes a rich young ruler. I think all those things have a purpose. And I think the Bible has a flow to it as always. Lord, I pray now that you speak to hearts. Lord, I don't know the heart of everybody that's watching today. But there's somebody out there that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray, Father, they'll realize it's not in what they have. It is in what they need. 
Father, I pray they'll realize the necessity and the need of Jesus Christ. Father, for those that have Christ as their Savior, I know today they're happy and rejoicing. Despite the circumstances that we may be going through, we still have Christ. And Father, we thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for Kayla and the time that she's taken this morning to come and teach for the kids. And Father, I thank you for Brother Kenny's sister, Kathy, for being with us today. And for Brother Fred and Brother Lois coming today and allowing the use of his laptop. Father, as always, we thank you for all those that have watched today. Father, I pray now that you be with us to the furnace of this day. Watch over, protect us, keep us in your care. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> and we will see you this evening at 530. And appreciate you being with us.